In this video, we'll look at diode-stabilized wind bridge oscillators and show a technique for analyzing their negative feedback loops. We'll also look at how pure the sine waves they produce are. My previous video was on bulb-stabilized wind bridge oscillators, but here's a reminder. First of all, the basic structure of a wind bridge oscillator is two feedback loops. There's a positive feedback loop around the bottom that sets the frequency, and a negative feedback loop around the top that controls the gain. And the tricky part of this circuit is that that gain has to be exactly three. If it's higher than three, the amplitude will increase until clipping occurs. And if it's less than three, the output will just die out. So there has to be something in the circuit that stabilizes the negative feedback loop to keep the gain exactly three. An incandescent bulb is one choice. Some diodes are, are another choice. Here's the bulb stabilized oscillator again. In all of these oscillators, the gain is determined by the formula 1 plus RF divided by RB, where RF and RB are resistors in the negative feedback loop. The bulb's resistance increases when the bulb heats up and decreases when the bulb cools off. This means that when the bulb heats, the gain reduces, and when the bulb cools, the gain increases. This, this action is what stabilizes the gain to be exactly 3 in the bulb stabilized circuit. See my previous video for more on this. In the diode stabilized circuit, RB is now just a resistor and RF becomes a network of diodes and resistors. There is more, more than one version of this network in use. We'll look at a couple in this video, but we'll start with this one. How does this network acting as RF stabilize the circuit? Assume the amplitude is very low. In this case, the diodes D2 and D3 prevent current from passing through resistor R3 at the top. And that means that RF's value is determined only by R5, and the gain of the, of the circuit becomes equal to 1 plus 22 divided by 10, which is 3.2. 3.2 is greater than 3, so the amplitude grows. In contrast, consider a case where the amplitude is very high. In this case, current flows across R3, so the gain is 1 plus 110 paralleled with 22 divided by 10. That works out to be 2.8. That gain is less than 3, so now the amplitude decreases. So the amplitude decreases when it needs to and increases when it needs to. But this is a fairly hand wavy or casual argument. Maybe we can do better. We can use LT Spice to more fully characterize the network we labeled RF. We can see what it does for very high amplitudes, very low amplitudes, and everything in between. We can also see how it, how it affects and distorts sine waves. Here's our oscillator in LT Spice. I guess the first thing we should do is see if it really works. So we'll run it and click on out to see the, out, the output of the oscillator. And if we zoom in, we see a nice sine wave. So it looks like that's working OK. Now remember that we expect the output to have three times the amplitude of the input. So it would be good to measure that. And these measure statements down here in, in LT Spice do that automatically. So we can view the, the uh, measurements by going to the right menu and looking at the Spice log. And so this gives us the RMS amplitude of in, the RMS amplitude of out, and also divides them for us and shows that the ratio is indeed 3, as we expect. It's also set to measure the frequency of the sine wave. And we're seeing just under 16 kilohertz, um, which is what we expect according to the frequency formula. So it looks like everything's working OK. And the next thing we want to do is to, uh, is to open up a SPICE model that focuses on just the negative feedback loop, just the part here. And so we'll do that next. We'll close that, close that, and open this. And so I'll zoom out slightly. And so what we see here is a model that is just the, the resistor diode network that makes up the negative feedback loop. Previously, the output of the op amp was feeding the input, and this would attenuate the signal by a factor of roughly three, depending on the input voltage. And, and then it would appear as the output, which would then go to the negative input of the op amp. Now, this is set up, um, well, this, this node here, this voltage source, is set up in such a way that when the simulation starts at time zero, the voltage is going to be zero. And when the simulation ends at time TM, which is currently set to 20 seconds, the voltage will be 20. So in the graph that we'll see when we run, the horizontal axis is time, but time in seconds equals volts. So now let's run the simulation. <laughs> 
So we do that here. And we see a bunch of curves. Why do we see a bunch of curves? And that's because of this step parameter here in, in LT Spice. So what this is doing is a separate Spice run for every value of R from 10K to 260K ohms, incrementing by 50K ohms. And R is this resistor here. And so what we'll find is, is that changing this value of R actually changes the amplitude of the uh, output waveform in the oscillator. So it's interesting to look at the behavior of this network for different values of R. And SPICE lets us kind of tell which is which. We can view a step legend, and that shows us that the bottom curve, the green one, corresponds to R equals 10K. The next one up, blue, corresponds to 60K, and then 110K, and so on up. And um, so the next thing we need to do is to dive into, into these curves. And well, let's, I think we were, well, let's do this. So we can select just one curve to focus on. So we'll do the one for 110 kilo ohms, which is the one we just ran actually in the previous SPICE model. So now I can click here and get a cursor. And remember we said that for very small amplitudes, like all the way to the right, where time is zero, which means volts is zero, the gain that this network is giving us is three. So the input is three times the amplitude of the output. So it's 3.2, and that's about, that's exactly what we predicted from our hand wavy argument. Whereas if the amplitude becomes large, so here it's 20 seconds or 20 volts, and it's 2.84, we, we had said 2.8, which was actually a round down. So this is kind of proving the correctness of our hand wavy argument. But but now uh, I'm just going to zoom in, so I have to zoom out again. Um, but but now, um, but now we can explore, you know, what the values are for any DC voltage, you know, between large like 20 and small like zero. So in particular, as we slide the cursor along here, we can get to a point where, looking at the cursor output here, so look at the vertical, and so as we slide this. We can find a point where the gain is exactly three. That's about as close as we're going to get. And so what you might predict is that the amplitude of the sine wave in the oscillator would be equal to the number of volts showed on the on the horizontal axis. So 950 millivol millivolts in this case. Again, um, seconds equal volts. Um, but this is a d pure DC analysis. The actual oscillator is running with sine waves, so that's not strictly true. But, but it does give you an idea of what the amplitude would be. And we can get some insights by looking at all of our other curves. We can get our curves back just by running again. So here they are. So notice the horizontal line with value three, you know, going from left to right across the screen here. And uh, the different curves correspond to different values of R, as we've said. And so lower values of R are lower curves and higher values of R are higher curves. So the point at which the curves intersect the three line um, moves to the right, thus higher voltage, with increasing R. So that's telling us that if we use a bigger value of R, that the amplitude will increase. If we use too big a value of R, I think the amplitude would increase to the point where it clipped. And so these curves give you a good tool to analyze the, the, the amplitude response to changing R and may even give you some clues to the speed of convergence and things like that. Before we leave, let's let's just do a sort of example, though, to make sure that the stabilization mechanism is clear. Like if we start, if the system somehow gets into this point here, where the amplitude is a little over 3 volts, but but the gain is 1.9, and and that's less than 3. And so that's telling us that the that the amplitude is too high. And the fact that the gain is less than three means that the amplitude will, will decrease. And so maybe the system gets to here. And now the amplitude is 376 millivolts, but the gain is 3.08, 3.09. And the fact that it's above three means that the, the amplitude has to increase. And so the system will, you know, because the gain is bigger than three, the amplitude will go up. And if it gets too far, it'll go back down and, and eventually it'll settle. Um, at the stable point of, of a gain of three. So that's how the diode stabilization works.
So this analysis was for r equals um, 10k because the the cursors were were tracking the green line and that's that's the 10k line. But one thing I'll, I want to point out, let me in fact let's zoom in here. So the with this particular network, the gain can never get all that high, and what that suggests is is that the system isn't likely to overshoot with very high amplitudes even at startup. It's it's going to kind of creep up to where it needs to be and and uh, and settle down without a lot of overshoot. How pure is the sine wave produced by, by this diode stabilized Wienbridge oscillator? To explore that, I've replaced the previous model with a slightly different one. Instead of feeding it that, that ramping DC voltage, I'm feeding it a 1600 hertz sine wave. And the amplitude of the sine wave matches the stable point of the oscillator when R3 is 110K. So let's let's look and see if we can tell whether the output sine sine wave is as pure as the input sine wave, which is pure by definition. It's being produced by Spice. So let's run it, and I've got um, automatically some curves put out, some traces. So we'll let it finish. So what we're seeing is is V in in green, which you can barely see because it's matching the blue one very exactly. And the, the blue one is three times V out. Remember in a absolutely perfect system, three times V out would be equal to V in and there'd be no discrepancy at all. And so it looks like it's doing pretty well. Let's, let's zoom in some. And um, there's a little bit of you know green showing through, so it's not perfect. And in fact, let's zoom in right to the top. And we can actually see that that the output is just a little bit uh, higher in the amplitude than than it should be if it's perfect, and that's suggesting that our our network is distorting the the sine wave a little bit, as in fact it must be because the diodes are nonlinear devices. We we know that that it can't be perfect, and in fact that's that's the reason that some people prefer. Um, other methods than diode stabilization for Wienbridge oscillators. They, these diodes are always going to introduce a little bit of distortion, but they make the circuit pretty easy and they can get pretty good. So let's zoom out again and, um, and actually zoom in a little bit more or zoom into an intermediate level. And so the third thing here is, is actually the difference between V in and three times V out. And so if you were to say, oh, that little overshoot is just the amplitude isn't perfectly three, but it's still a perfect sine wave. If that were true, the difference uh, between the two curves would be a sine wave itself. And this isn't a sine wave. And maybe you can tell, like right here, that's sort of a straight line-ish thing. That's the diodes doing, kind of, kind of acting at their worst. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's uh, you know very much not a sine wave. So, so at around the zero point, we, we see this distortion and we also see the little bit of overshoot. So this gives us a pretty good indication that our, our output sine wave isn't, isn't exactly perfect. But when we actually run the circuit built on the breadboard, we'll try to measure that too. I almost forgot to show you, we're, we're also measuring the RMS of input and output and the ratio to see if they're in the one to three ratio that they have to be in order to be stable. So we look at the uh, SPICE layer log to get those results and we see their RMS values. But in particular, here's the ratio 2.9999. So very close to three. So this is indeed the stable point of the oscillator. Remember I said that more than one arrangement of the network of resistors and diodes can be used. Here's an alternative one. This is actually from a Wikipedia article on Wienbridge oscillators. And so first of all, why would you want to choose different networks and different arrangements of diodes and resistors? Well, the goal is to produce a sine wave that's more pure. And there are trade-offs between like how fast it converges and, and what the purity is. You, you know that these sine waves won't be perfect. You've already seen from those previous curves that things aren't, aren't linear because of the diodes. But some networks can work better than others. So I thought this one would be an interesting one to look at and, and actually build. But one problem I can see is that these values are not corresponding at all to standard resistors. So I think I'll modify it a little bit and then we'll look at that. Here's my tweaked version of the Wikipedia circuit. Notice these variables RF 
used in these two resistor values. Um, they're modeling a trim pot, a 2K trim pot, and uh, that we'll actually have on the breadboard. And the, the current setting of the trim pot is 600 ohms. And let's see, the this is the output that will be three times the input. The circuit on the Wikipedia actually puts the output here on the on the other side of the diodes. That gives it a slightly lower amplitude and probably makes it just a little bit cleaner. But we may not pay too much attention to that. So let's run it and look at the output. And uh, look at that. Um, it's all it's taking it one second to reach full amplitude. It's sort of struggling to grow to full amplitude. Once it does, what does the wave look like? And we see uh, what looks like to be pretty nice sine waves. And we can take a look at the input. And those, you know, those are a third the uh, the height. You can take my word for that, I guess. Um, but so anyway, the circuit works. And so the next thing to do is to close this and zoom in on just its negative feedback loop, like like we did. And so here's in a, the equivalent circuit. Here, so this is once again our trim pot, and now we're going to step the RF value, essentially tweaking the trim pot from 500 ohms to 1300 ohms by by steps of 100 ohms. So let's run, and uh, so once again all of those curves show up, and uh, they're all kind of nicely parallel, and and uh, well, kind of, kind of look pretty good. So no, notice that this lowest one, which would correspond to 500 ohms on the on the trim pot, is actually below three. So I can be quite sure that 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 would not um, would not start to oscillate, at least in the simulation. And so the one above it is is the 600 ohm, yes, the 600 ohm line. So let's focus in on that. Select steps, pick 600. And look at that, how it's just barely above three. And uh, then finally hits hits three at its approximate stable point here. So we saw it kind of struggle to get started. And on the real bread, breadboard, it's unclear that that would oscillate. But th it's the fact that, that it's just just barely you know able to oscillate that makes me think that this circuit can give some pretty, pretty clean sine waves relative to the other. And uh, that's why I wanted to build it. Um, it. We might need to have the trim pot set a little bit higher. And so let's let's run again. And you, you see, as the uh, trim pot gets turned up, the amplitude of the the sine wave will increase, and the chances of it actually oscillating will also go up. So with that, let's put it on a breadboard and run. Here are some shots of the breadboard. You can see the diodes and the trim pot. Here it is from a slightly different angle. The op amp is an LF411. OK, the scope's on single trigger. So let's turn the power onto the circuit. And we captured the oscillator startup. You can see that it does overshoot an amplitude a little bit and then settles back down. The sine wave looks pretty good. Let's go back to uh, normal trigger. And um, so here we have. The yellow is channel one is the output, the, the one that's three times the input. And the purple is the negative input. So the one should be three times the other. And let's use the system, some statistics to check that. And so I need to clear here to let, let those start averaging. And what we expect is that channel one is about three times channel channel 2, so we have 1.13 divided by 0.37456, and that's 3.02, they're rounding up a little bit. So that's as we expect, and it looks like, this, the, like the oscillator is working well. And I suppose what's most interesting is to try to figure out how pure this sine wave is, and so let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and just turn channel 2 off to get it out of the way and adjust this to give it give the FFT some something to work on and uh, let's see what we get so as the FFT gathers some data it, it automatically detects peaks and and measures their amplitude and so we can see that the main frequency is about 1.7 kilohertz so that's a, a little more than what we expected but that's probably due to component variation on the breadboard 
but um, more 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 to the point right now, the the next two frequencies, the next two harmonics, are actually down 50 50. 1.6 and 53 decibels. So for a dialed stabilized uh, Veenbridge oscillator, that's actually very good. Let's go back to the oscilloscope display and uh, let's fiddle with the trim pot a little bit. Now the problem is it doesn't fit very firmly in the in the breadboard, so it kind of jumps around as I do stuff with it. But I'd like to try to turn it down to the point that it barely oscillates. So I'm going to bring it down a little bit. And you should be able to see the volume come down. If my screwdriver doesn't fall out of that slot, which it does, that might be about as good as I can do. <clears throat> so I don't know if that's very different than it was before. But I'm uh, interested to see if, if that changes the FFT display. And it it looks like it did a little bit. You might think that the lower volume would would be slightly better. So now the those two second harmonics are down minus 72 dB, but the main signal is down minus nine. So that that's suggesting, and if we can do some quick math, that we might be you know 64 dB down the the harmonics. That's that's really quite good. And maybe we'll try going the other way. Let's let's turn the turn the pot to make the amplitude a lot higher. Which okay, that of course makes everything very stable. That's affecting the frequency a little bit. So let's see if we still have a sine wave. Yep. All right, that's about as much as I can do, I think. So now the amplitude's a lot higher, and we'll go back to the FFT and see what it looks like. And um, yeah, sure enough, it's not not nearly as good a sine wave. So you know, one of the keys for making the sine wave good is to make it just barely oscillate, and that's what this Wikipedia version of the circuit does well. You may be wondering why I'm using my, my Siglent SDS 1104XE uh, oscilloscope instead of Scopy in the M2K. And the reason for that is I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that the M2K has enough dynamic range to, to do these um, FFT measurements. I'll, I'll have to check into that more. I may make a video about that. This video is getting pretty long, so I think we should end here. We've seen how diode stabilization works in Veenbridge oscillators, and we showed an analysis technique using LT Spice. We looked at two different resistor diode networks and measured the second using a Siglent SDS oscilloscope. The second circuit has better sine waves, although I didn't really show that. Um, and also, full circuit stability is easier with diodes than incandescent bulbs, but bulbs produce better sine waves. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching.